Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland, Portland's own Citizens Forum. My name is Susan Hammer and I'm president of the City Club. I'd like to remind you to turn off your cell phones, electronic devices, and other things that make noise before we begin today. First, we have a few announcements. Our next Friday forum on June 30 will be a new look at the state of the region with Metro Council President David Bragdon. We have some upcoming events at City Club. The City Club Citizens Read Book Discussion Group this, uh, this coming Monday, the 26th at 7 p.m. In City, at City Club Commons will be with Portland author David Oates and his book, City Limits. The Portland Business Alliance and the City Club of Portland are co-hosting a breakfast with Frederick Hitz, who is the former Inspector General of the Central Intelligence Agency and the author of a recent book entitled The Great Game, the Myth and Reality of Espionage. This will be on Wednesday, the 28th of June, at 7.30 in the morning to 9 a.m. here at the Governor Hotel. Coming up in July, we have a new Leaders Council uh, organizing a day visit to the Bull Run Watershed. This is an area that's normally off limits. It'll be on Saturday, July 15th. And don't forget about our summer-long series, The Citizen Salon, the first of which was held earlier this week. These provocative dinners, dinner discussions are gonna be going on this summer in the home of a City Club member, and they will continue through August. This is not only an entertaining way to raise funds for City Club, but it also helps raise the level of dialogue around issues that are important to all of us and to our city. And remember Dr. Trunke, who talked to us two weeks ago and told us that health care reform had to begin at the grassroots level? Well, the new Leaders Council will be presenting health care reform meetup sign up on Wednesday, June 28th, 5.30 to 7.30 at the City Club Commons. Please come for a discussion of how you can be part of this effort. And finally, the City Club Research uh, Board will be uh, releasing a report on voter-owned elections in the next few weeks, so watch your bulletin for that information. We have special brochures on the city, uh, Citizen Salons at the table in the back, and details on the many other events that are going on at City Club, which you can find in your weekly bulletin on the City Club website. And when you're on the website, you can get information about membership, our TV and radio broadcast schedule, the Citizens Blog online forum. You can listen to today's forum online, and you can also purchase audio CDs and videotapes. Now, we have three new members of City Club that I'd like to welcome here today. And when you hear your name, would you please stand up or wave, and then we will recognize each of you. Our new members are Mary McPherson, where are you, Mary? Okay. Susan Davis. And, and Mary Somerset. Welcome to each of you to City Club. We are so uh, fortunate to have in Portland great corporate citizens that help make these City Club forums possible. Our sponsors this quarter are Kaiser Permanente and Stoll Reeves LLP. Could you please join me in thanking our sponsors? So our program today is voter-owned elections. What worked, what didn't, and what do we really want? Last year, the Portland City Council passed an ordinance thought to be the most comprehensive, comprehensive of its kind for a city in the United States. 
allowing taxpayer financing of races for city commissioner and for mayor. We've now been through one primary. We've had three candidates, one incumbent and two challengers, who used public financing. But all this has left us with a lot of questions. Can we really have a credible program without a vote of the people who paid for it? If the system is designed to bring newcomers to the electoral process, does it accomplish that? Or is it, as critics say, an incumbent protection act? But if we don't have publicly financed elections, how do we keep a few wealthy individuals, organizations, or unions from dominating our city elections? We are so fortunate to have with us today three outstanding individuals who bring different perspectives and experience to the discussion of publicly financed campaigns. On my, uh, well, uh, two people down is Eric Stan. <laughs> Not on my immediate left, but two people over is Eric Stan, our, our city commissioner, and he has been a city commissioner since 1996. Commissioner Stan has been a proponent of publicly financed elections and received public financing for his primary campaign this year. When he's not uh, acting as a city commissioner, Eric enjoys spending time with his two and a half year old son, Nicholas. Sandy McDonough, on his left, is president and CEO of the Portland Business Alliance, known as PBA. PBA works to ensure the economic vitality of the Portland metropolitan region and downtown Portland. PBA has been a critic of the law allowing publicly financed elections. When Sandy's, Sandra's not running PBA, she enjoys spending time with her 14-year-old son, whom she adopted from Guatemala. He is the light of her life. And on my immediate left is Nick Bundick, who observed the 2006 election as a reporter for the Portland Tribune. He is here today to share with us the media and public perspective on how the publicly financed campaign system worked. When he's not reporting, he enjoys watching the World Cup soccer as much as possible, betting on Ghana as the winner. <laughs> and a comment on today's forum. Although we do have different points of view uh, represented here today, today's program is, depended, is intended to be more of a discussion than a debate. The purpose is to enlighten and inform our membership and audience about publicly financed campaigns. Who benefits from it, what it costs the taxpayers, what works and what doesn't. So this is our format. We'll begin with four minute introductory remarks from each of the individuals who are on, on the panel today. And then we will uh, move to questions that I will ask to each of the panelists. They'll have one minute to answer them, and Heather Gmetz down here in the front will be keeping time. At the end of that, each, uh, we will have questions from the audience, and then finally, each uh, of the panelists will have one minute to uh, add any additional remarks or wrap up. So uh, let's begin with Commissioner Stan. Well, thanks, Susan. I, I think this is going to be fun, and I really appreciate the chance to kind of debate, not really debate, but discuss the things, because I think this is a work in progress, although I think a very good one. Let me start with the big picture. In all the time that I've been working on campaign finance reform, I'm yet to have anybody on either side of the debate come up to me and tell me they think the way we are funding campaigns in this country is working well. But sometimes I think that the discussion is too much about how we're funding campaigns and not about what happens after the campaign. I would submit to you that the, mo the major policy problems that are facing this country, that are dragging down our businesses and I think are crippling our world, can be directly tied to the undue influence of the campaign finance system. Look at three of them. Healthcare, I think that pharmaceutical companies and all the things that go on are what, what makes a good healthcare system impossible in this country. We pay more money per capita for healthcare than any industrialized nation and have the lowest rate of insurance tied to the influence of money. Global warming, the science has been clear for 10 years, yet it's, it continues to be something that we cannot make progress on, mostly because of undue influence. Uh, our energy policy, which I think could be the kind of thing that knocks this country off of the place it should be, which is first in the world uh, in its economy, is highly, highly driven by bad policy decisions. We have not raised the mileage standards on cars since Jimmy Carter, all because Congress won't do it, all because of the influence of campaign contributions. This is, if we want to take on the fundamental issues that are 
holding our nation back. We have to get after the cause of why they're not getting moved on. And the cause of, of, the, of the lack of progress on global warming is not science. The science has been clear for a long time. The cause is special interests blocking the Congress from moving. So what we're doing here in Portland, I think you have to see in that context, we are trying to come up with a different model and a different way to run elections. And if you look at it very closely, Oregon has one of the worst campaign finance systems. Because of our wonderful First Amendment, which I support in Oregon, uh, the, the, I think that was a program you had last week, we're not allowed to have any contributions on uh, limits on the amount that people can contribute, nor the type of entity that can contribute. So in the two times that I've sought re-election as a city commissioner, what's, what I generally would do before this system was in place was ask the people who do business with the city of Portland for five to ten thousand dollars. Often they would say yes and give it to me from three or four different limited liability corporations so you would never even know who was actually donating it. They were not dishonest, I was not dishonest, that's the system. Portland, I think it works reasonably well, although I would say to you, I think the Northwest Parking Plan was decided too quickly because of campaign contributions. I've seen land use cases and other things that I think could have been better. But most importantly, I think the city is like any corporation, like any household, like anywhere in the world. It will gravitate its attention towards those things that are driving it. So when money fuels city campaigns, and keep in mind, historically, about 100 people and individuals funnel about 60% of the money that city council candidates run on. First time I ran for, for the city council in 1996 with a gr very grassroots effort, I had 800 contributors. Uh, but the, the, in 2002, I had 200. The average contribution went from 80 to $1,500, roughly. Um, and that doesn't, I, I'm using myself as the example because I don't want to point fingers at anybody. I don't think that's a good system. Uh, this last time around, and this is where I want to end my opening remarks on, was totally different. And I think it was very optimistic, and I think it bodes very, very well. I had 1,300 contributors this time around, way more than my first time, and six or 700 of the people who donated $5, to my opinion, are people I did not know who'd never donated before. For. And the whole campaign became about not can I get the League of Conservation voters endorsement uh, so that they will give me money, but so that I can then get to their list and organize people to try and go out. Um, the spending went way, way down. Four people spent 589000 in this race compared to two people, Nick Fish and Sam Adams, spending 800000 two years ago. And the whole focus became about grassroots organizing, about talking with people, including business people, including people who would traditionally bi give big donations. And what I think is there's a sense of possibility. There. The system still does need work, but anything worth having you have to fight for and keep working on, and you have to keep your eye on what do we need to do in this country, which has changed the way the political money game is played. It's great to be here today. I actually want to start by commending Commissioner Stan and our other city leaders for starting a really important conversation in our city. If we ask ourselves whether our elective system is working, I don't see how anybody can answer affirmatively. Only 28% of qualified voters in Multnomah County actually turned out to vote in our May primary. That astounds me. I'm a chronic voter. And I don't see how we can expect it to get better, considering that only 10% of qualified adults aged 18 to 34 voted in that election. I think it was absolutely right for City Council to start a discussion about how we can restore citizen confidence in our government and our election process. Where I differ is that City Council leapt quickly to a solution without actually defining the problem or looking at the broad array of solutions, some of which Commissioner Stan just mentioned. Is the problem really how we finance our elections? Or is there more, uh, some more deep-seated disenchantment and disengagement with government going on? I think it's the latter. And I am concerned that without much discussion, City Council decided the solution to this problem was taxpayer dollars at a time when they were telling us that they didn't have enough money to pay for the core services all of us as citizens depend upon. When this ordinance was passed in the spring of 2005, I actually reacted more as a mother than as a business person. At the time, my son was in seventh grade at Robert Gray Middle School. He did not have a science textbook because the schools could not afford to buy them. The $150,000 this city ordinance um, gives one candidate for one election would buy 10,000 science textbooks. As a mom, I was distressed that our city stated that children and families were our priority, 
but our leaders could find a way to pay for political advertisements before we could pay for school books. What about our other city priorities? The city budget states that public safety is a priority, but since 1997, we have seen the number of sworn officers in Portland go down 101. And we are now 169th in the nation in terms of our police coverage. The $150,000 a city ordinance provides to one candidate for a few months of campaigning would pay for a sworn officer for uh, more than a year. The 0506 budget noted that our transportation infrastructure is deteriorating due to age and heavy use. $150,000 would fill more than 1,000 potholes. $150,000 would put a homeless mother in an apartment for as much as 10 years. And it would pay for the water bills of 1,700 low-income families for a year. The city funded this program by taking a little bit to a lot of money from several different programs. They got money from the Transportation Fund, from the Water Fund, the Sewer Fund, the General Fund, and even a fund dedicated to schools. What we hear is that no program was hit, took a big financial hit. They estimated spending $1.3 million the first year. They actually spent around $450,000. Who doesn't think that's a lot of money? In my world, it is. And if they had that kind of money, why didn't they put it into a program that we already stated was a city priority? My bellwether is my dad, a retired city employee who lives on a fixed income in the Lentz neighborhood. The money the city will allocate to one candidate for one election would pay his city pension for eight years. I asked my dad how he thinks this city should spend $150,000 if they have that kind of extra money. And he said, put it in schools because the kids should be our priorities. And frankly, I agree with him. Thank you. Uh, hi there. Um, I guess I'm supposed to speak for the public and the media, and uh, I can't do that. I can't even speak for my newspaper, uh, but I will speak as someone who's been a political and government reporter for 15 years. Um, and I'm supposed to talk about how this uh, changed the way we do our job covering elections. And uh, I guess to, to address that question, um, the uh, amount of money a candidate has raised has always been viewed as sort of a, a measure of their legitimacy in the eyes of the press uh, and government, uh, I'm sorry, electoral reporting, for better or for worse, is uh, usually um, kind of a horse race sort of thing and who's raising the most money and this has obviously changed that dynamic. Um, you saw Emily Boyles, for instance, uh, getting equal play with uh, the other candidates in that race, and yet most of the people who were here to see Emily Boyles speak, uh, my impression from the reactions I saw in the City Club uh, audience was people did not view her as a serious candidate. Um, the, uh, you can tell I'm not a very good speaker, and I'm not even going to bother to tell jokes because my friends have told me that'd be a bad idea um, for me. The, uh, <laughs> but um, so it, it has changed the way reporters look at these races, and uh, someone who has received uh, city funding for their campaigns automatically gets treated as a serious candidate. It seems like that's. Uh, still not a perfect system. You saw people who were uh, real candidates. Uh, Dave Lister, who I think uh, addressed City Club and really uh, surprised a lot of people with um, his uh, seeming relative electability compared to what people thought coming in. Um, so I think as you looked at the media coverage over the course of the election, it changed as it went on. Um, and the reason I'm addressing this is because uh, the press is uh, a constitutionally recognized arm of our democracy. And uh, one of the problems that uh, I think is underlying the, the whole issue of money in elections is uh, candidates' ability to reach the voters. So um, I think 
uh, I'm totally bombing here, but um, the, my point is that I'm not sure that uh, voter-owned elections addressed all the problems of democracy that it, uh, its proponents say it is supposed to. You still had political journalism that fundamentally was um, horse race journalism. You did not see issues being uh, delved into to the extent to which voters could make intelligent, detailed choices. Uh, so um, I guess before I go, uh, some of the things that I'd like to see my colleagues on the panel address are, um, I've heard Commissioner Sten speak about sort of in generalities about how the new system will change, how elected officials behave. I'd like to hear him talk about how it was before the city council rescued him from uh, dirty money. Uh, what was it, what was it, uh, I mean, how far did he go to cater to uh, moneyed special interests? Um, I'd also like to hear from Sandy McDonough uh, what other city, what other wasteful city program has her organization ponied up as much money to eliminate in city government? <laughs> so. So the first question is for Commissioner Stan. Uh, Sandra McDonough pointed out that the city uh, commission didn't define the problem before enacting this ordinance. And um, Mr. Budnick has uh, pointed out that <clears throat> perhaps the uh, ordinance didn't address the problem that existed. So the question I have is, what is the problem that the publicly financed election is designed to fix, and how did it do it or not do it? Well, I think a lot of the arguments against any system, and particularly the ones you're gonna hear about this one, is that it's imperfect. And I don't believe this system is gonna fix all the problems that are ailing democracy. But I think there's a fundamental baseline problem of cynicism with the voters that is justified. I think our system is broken by the interest of big monies from the very top at the federal level on down. And voters are right to be distrustful of the electoral process when it's driven by sound bites. So it, does, it, it gives an opportunity for people to trust more where the money is coming from, how it's going. I think it will ultimately save us money. The only way that Sandy's argument that $150,000 could be spent on anything else is right is if you accept the premise behind it that the huge contributions that come into politicians cost you nothing. If you believe that those contributions cost you nothing, then Sandy is absolutely 100% right. You have $150,000 that was free and given. I believe after serving you for 10 years that those contributions cost you millions and millions of dollars and that a dollar, a dollar per person per year to fund a different system creates hope, creates access, creates a more level playing field and creates a chance for underlying, fixing underlying problems that, that, that um, plague our society. Okay, Sandra, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you to hold your applause so that we can keep the debate going. I know you all have strong feelings about this, but let's, uh, let's hold it till the end. Sandra, could you comment on the same question? I think it's a good question to figure out what problem it is that we're trying to fix, because if you look at what the elections in our city, the one I looked to most recently was Mayor Potter's elected. He was outspent 10 to 1, and he won by a landslide. And so I think we need to look at what the problem is in Portland, Oregon, and is this an appropriate use of scarce public dollars at this time in our city? I also want to address the dirty money. You know, dirty money is all in the eyes of the beholder and who needs it at that particular time. At the time that we were discussing this, let me tell you about some of the um, issues that actually elected officials were approaching me to have the business community help them fund. The schools levy, the children's initiative, we've been asked to help fund the election on the police, fire, disability, and retirement fund, Metro's parks levy, library levy, and uh, Phil Kiesling's open primary. So the question is, when is the money clean and when is the money dirty? Depends on who needs it at what time. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Budnick, I'm gonna restate the questions because I'm not sure it's been directly addressed yet. What is the problem that the publicly financed election system was designed to fix? 
Um, my understanding is that, uh, and I think Commissioner Sten can speak to this uh, as the primary proponent on the City Council, but um, the uh, problem it's supposed to address is money, money's influence on uh, public policy on the world around us. Um, and do you want me to address? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I'll ask uh, Commissioner Stan then the question that you raised, and that is, how was it before, I think your term was, the council rescued you from accepting dirty money? <laughs> uh, well, I don't, I don't think the council rescued me. And again, I, I think that uh, the donors to campaigns are honest, and I think that in this town, people are honest. I mean, part of why I'm arguing for reform in Portland is not because I think we have a huge chunk of scandals, although I don't think we're so perfect that it couldn't happen. It's happened to all kinds of places across, across the country, and we've seen major scandals in Salem very recently. And I would submit to you that the Oregon legislature's inability to fund schools is based on partisanship, which is driven by a desire to raise money, um, and, and that's why we're not funding schools, and that's why you know that we need to kind of take this thing on. Um, but for me, what it did was create a whole different kind of experience, which I think is good for policy. Um, I spend 80% of my time on most of my election races raising money, which means I'm basically talking with a very small group of wonderful people, many of them whom are, are great, great civic treasures. But I'm not out organizing with and talking with the various groups, the neighborhood groups, environmental groups, the labor groups, and everybody else. And so it's a fundamentally different experience. And if you saw what Amanda Fritz did, um, she, 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 she gave a very viable raise to Commissioner Saltzman um, and did it by going going out and, and raising the money. And Commissioner Saltzman and her had a terrific race against each other. It was a totally different experience. i got to stop now. Okay. My next question is for Sandra McDonough. Uh, do you think publicly financed elections favor incumbents, challengers, neither, both, why? Well, I think if you look at what happen, has happened nationally, there's been different experiences. And of course, every ordinance is different. I think this ordinance is actually set up, and I'm not sure that I would say it's the intended consequence because I don't believe it is, but I think it's essentially set up to a favor incumbents, and let me tell you why. It, in, it ensures that no challenger will ever outspend an incumbent, and incumbents have a built-in advantage of name familiarity and the ability to get media coverage that no challenger can get. And the way a challenger can overcome that advantage is by raising money to get the media exposure. So basically setting up a system where a challenger isn't going to be able to outspend an incumbent inherently in, um, favors the incumbent because the incumbent has a natural advantage. Would you like to comment, Mr. Budding? Uh, I'll give it a try. The, um, uh, I don't know that it necessarily is going to favor the incumbent every time around, but if you look at how it worked in this race, I think it definitely favored uh, the incumbent. And the way it did so is not necessarily monetarily, but um, uh, setting up the same kind of dynamic that you saw in, this is my opinion, um, setting up the same kind of dynamic that you saw with the Potter Francisconi race, in which the more money Jim Francisconi raised, the worse he came out looking. And I think uh, that's a sort of a powerful symbolic dynamic that voters get on almost a subliminal level. So um, I don't think that advantage that Commissioner Sten saw this time around, uh, and I don't know that it's any more than the advantage he had already, but I think um, that is that can be overcome by some creative uses of independent expenditure campaigns, which um, as any sort of political consultant can tell you, that's the big problematic area with uh, the intent of this program and how it can be carried out. Um, I, I think that that argument is silly. Um, this clearly does not favor incumbents. Um, we are the only elected body in the history of the country to pass this because, it, because without a scandal, because incumbents want, always want to, to control the playing field. Amanda Fritz was able to run strong against Dan Saltzman with this approach. Um, Ginny Burdick actually outspent me by $40,000. I'm one of the few candidates to win in a long time with less money other than Mayor Potter. Um, she worked the rules very, very well um, to do that. That's something the Election Commission has to look at.
that, but at the end of the day, look at my race. I had one candidate running against me primarily because I was voter-owned, Senator Ginny Burdick, and had Emily Boyles qualified, and she just as easily could have to, and spent the money well, I would undoubtedly have been in a runoff. That dynamic with people coming at me from both sides and me having to defend my record on the council is unimaginable under the old system. It hasn't happened in 30 years. And so it clearly does not favor incumbents. It opens up the playing field, and if there's any doubt that um, this community is willing to vote out an incumbent, that happened pretty clearly in some other races. So I think Ginny Burdick would have actually done much better against me if she'd run voter-owned. I think people supported me because of this. The next question I have, and I'll ask it of each of you, is uh, really related to evaluating what we have and any reforms that are necessary. And it is, now that we've seen the system operate once, what should we do with it? Should we continue it as is? Should we modify it? Should we get rid of it entirely? Or should we be doing something else? Uh, Ms. McDonough. Well, I, personally, I think that at this time we can't afford to pay for this program because we can't afford to pay for the essential services that we have in this city. But first thing I would say is that City Council, if they want to continue to look at how we reform elections, should look at the wide array of options that are out there. 37 states limit campaign expenditures, and I think that's something this state needs to seriously look at. Other states, other cities put a, a term limit on city council members. I'm not advocating that, but I'm just saying we should be looking at all the different options for how we can get more people involved in government. And the last thing I'll say, and it's what we have said very consistently, is that this is a fundamental change to how we do elections in this city. And before we implement, we should ask voters if they actually want this so-called voter-owned elections. If we have the election, I think we should have it in November when there's no city council race on the ballot that will be impacted by it. If we have it and voters say they want to have this, then fine, we have it in the city. But we shouldn't test run it for four years and spend potentially millions of dollars before we ask the voters that question. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Commissioner Stan? Um. Well, first I want to say in terms of the voter approval, the council's original legislation says this will go to the voters after three cycles, and I think it's a very smart and tried and true model when you're working on strong reforms and big reforms that are that are going to need to be improved that you try it for a couple of years and improve it before you send it out so you don't codify a system that's got inadvertent mistakes. I also think, to be blunt, that it's very important that the voters had a chance to see it and will get to see it before they vote on it because there was $365,000 raised to toss this out by 20 organizations. 20 grand from Comcast, about the same from Quest and PGE. A tiny number of groups were trying to toss this out. They would have spent a million dollars to toss this out without the voters having even had a chance to try it. Things that can be fixed, I, I think we should go to registered voters. I believe there needs to be a more thorough signature verifying process so that, that an Emily Boyles type situation doesn't happen. And I think we should probably move the date to qualify back a bit so that there's more time to really scrutinize everything. There's a variety of things that should be there. But keep in mind with Emily Boyles, the difference between Emily Boyles and Dan Doyle, Emily Boyles got busted on a timely fashion. Compare that to, to Abramoff, Doyle, any of the things that you want to look at in, the, in, the, in this country. It doesn't happen in the, in, in, in the traditional system. Mr. Budnick. Um, I, uh, I, don't, I don't have any strong opinions on uh, how this law, this ordinance should be reformed. Uh, but talking to political consultants, people in the business, um, as I said earlier, the independent expenditure campaigns are uh, a good way to game this system. Another potential way to game this system are multiple candidates uh, tapping into city funds, running against an incumbent. Um, I don't know if there are ways to address these problems, um, but uh, they're out there. Okay, thank you. We're going to move now to the question and answer part of our program and take questions from the audience. Um, and there's one microphone over there. A privilege of membership is asking a question. Uh, you should limit your question to 30 seconds and it should be ended with a question mark. Our first question will be asked by our board host, who is Larry Wallach. Larry is Dean of the College of Urban and Public Affairs at Portland State University. He's also a professor emeritus in public health at the University of California in Berkeley. Uh, Larry is a member of the City Club Board of Governors. Larry. 
Thank you, Susan, and, and thanks to all our guests today for, I think, a very informative review of this issue. You've been talking about uh, pretty much nuts and bolts things. I have somewhat of a more general question. In Portland, uh, two values that sort of drive a lot of civic life are civic engagement and fairness. And in thinking about how well uh, voter-owned elections or public finance campaigns fit with Portland, I would want to hear from you a response to the question, do publicly financed campaigns strengthen or weaken the values of civic participation and fairness? Well, we test drove the election, or this process in May, the May primary, and we had about the lowest voter turnout we've seen. As I said, 28% of qualified voters in Multnomah County voted, and only 10% of 18 to 34-year-olds voting. Something is missing, and I don't think this is the panacea for it. I think we need to have a better discussion led by government leaders like Commissioner Stan about what's going on with our voters out there and what's causing them to be so disengaged from the process. Um, I think it did promote more civic engagement and fairness and uh, a bunch of fronts. I had way, way more people working with me on the campaign. And usually, again, what, I, what you do with interest groups is you try and get their endorsements so they'll give you money so you can run TV ads. Um, with $150,000 to work with, which is a very small number for those of you, which is most of you who follow politics, you actually have to design an outreach strategy. And I can actually see right now from the precinct reports that we did monumentally better in those areas where we went out and knocked on the door. And for somebody who yeah, had a good lead but got, got through without a runoff by 400 votes, there's no doubt that the grassroots organizing engaged people. But anecdotally, what I saw over and over and over was people coming up to me and getting engaged and wanting to talk about it. So is this enough to turn, o turn around the national trends? But I just think we're, we're, we're confusing cause and effect if we don't believe that, that, that the completely broken national finance system, the preponderance of TV ads, by the way, there were almost no TV ads this city council cycle, which I thought was kind of nice, not just seeing myself, maybe you didn't want to see me either, um, is that, is that it's, it's changing things and it's beginning to build a base from which you can try and do things differently. So I think, I think this is more fair. I think an, uh, you only have an hour, but it would have been really fascinating to talk to the three or four very serious candidates, um, one a bartender, one an activist, one a business person who attempted to qualify and did not make it. We haven't talked about that, but it appears that the $1,005 uh, le level was, was, was about right because, because a lot of people, they even say, well, I, could, I wasn't quite ready, but they went out and engaged lots and lots of people. So I think it clearly engaged more people than the traditional system. I think it's f more fair in the sense that it gives an opportunity for just about anybody who's serious about it to try and get into the race, whether they have the, the really close connections with the large donors or not. Um, the bar you're being asked to judge it by is, is it perfect? It is not perfect but it's way better than what we had. Mr. Budnick, do you wish to comment? Uh, as far as civic engagement, I think the bottom line uh, measure of that is voter turnout. And um, I think there's a lot more reforms and changes that need to be made in order to affect that measure. Uh, I don't know that voter-owned elections is going to have a huge effect on voter turnout. Uh, I don't think most people are aware of what voter-owned elections is. Okay, our first question. Lee Stevenson, Kuhn, City Club member. Uh, my question is directed primarily to Ms. McDonough, but others are free to respond. Um, hi, Sandy. Uh, you're going to love this. Uh, my question is based on a premise. The premise is that Big business supports candidates, particularly in the legislature, who are no tax, no new tax people, and who will vote down and, and, and obstruct efforts to buy school books for children. Uh, my question, uh, why does business not support people who are willing to work for revenue solutions in Salem? Well, I see Greg McPherson sitting out there, and I suspect if we looked at Greg McPherson's CNEs, he has a fair amount of business contributions on his CNEs. Um, I'm a card-carrying Democrat, first president I ever 
well, presidential candidate I ever voted for was George McGovern. So um, I have to tell you, I, I think that's a big generalization, Lee. I think you've got businesses that support Democrats, businesses that support Republicans. You've got businesses down there. You know, we, the Business Alliance, had our lobbyist working with the school district and the city's lobbyists, and Eric knows this, we've talked a lot, the city about this, getting the funding measure passed at the special session in um, this last spring to keep our schools open. The business interests here in, in Portland agreed to tax themselves another year or two to the tune of $9 million to keep schools open. We um, fund many, many different campaigns year after year after year for schools and children and a number of other things. So, you know, that's one of the big problems we have in this city sometimes is that we like to make gross generalizations. I'm never going to say I speak for all of business because I don't. We're as varied and, and as um, rich in our diversity as any other entity is. And so I think what we need to do is to make sure that we're having the right conversations and not making statements to say, why does big business do that, which polarizes us, instead of trying to pull us together and find a solution together. And you know what? I have to tell you, I think that's what our city leaders want to do. I know that's what Commissioner Sten wants to do, and we want to work with him on it. You have a situation where a fundamental piece of business that, that's humane as well as, as smart, like funding schools is not getting done year after year after year, and every player says it's not their fault and they're believable. So I don't disagree with what Sandy just said. You have a structural problem. And at some point, you have to say, I'm going to take some risk and try some structural solutions. And I think by Portland moving on changing the fundamental driving force, which I believe is what is stymieing Salem, money, special interest, and partisan politics, which are dependent upon the lobbies, um, we're, we're trying to take a step in that direction. At some point, you have to say, OK, if, if what Sandy's saying is true, and I'm not arguing it's not, that they're trying to do the right thing, that Representative McPherson is trying to do the right thing, that everybody that's ever spoken before City Club of all political persuasions intends to fund schools. It's never been, nobody's ever stood before you and say, we're going to fund, not fund schools. You have a structural problem. And so I'm talking about, let's make structural change instead of saying, oh, let's, let's kind of have a debate and throw out some ideas and not do anything. These are the kind of steps we have to take to change the fundamental way politics and policy are done in this state, or we're going to head for the bottom like we've been doing the last 10 years. Okay, next question. Chris Smith, City Club member. Uh, there's a chronic complaint in Portland politics that the area east of 82nd is underrepresented at City Hall. I had the chance to analyze contribution reports working with the Money and Politics Research Action Project on a geographic basis. And the three traditionally funded candidates, uh, Senator Burdick, uh, Dan Saltzman, and Dave Lister, had exactly two contributions from individuals east of 82nd. There were 114 VOE contributions from 72 households uh, east of 82nd. Isn't that an unalloyed good? I think a, a better measurement might be to see where people are voting. And are people east of 82nd voting? And if they're not, then we have to figure out what we need to do to get them to vote. I'm actually over in that part of the woods all the time. As I said, my dad lives in Lentz. So I'm there, and you know what? That's not an area where people have a lot of money to give to campaigns or to anything else. And I think what we need to do is to make sure that they feel represented in City Hall, that people in City Hall are listening to them, and they're inspired to go out and vote. Yes is the answer. It's a very good thing. Um, and what I found with the $5 contribution request is that it's a wonderful level because everybody can do it. You're insulting a, a low-income person if you tell them they can't scrape together $5 even on a, a Social Security pension, and it makes them part of the democratic system. And so I think you see a bunch more people taking part east of 82nd than you saw under the traditional system. It's startling when you compare the two different types of candidates, the amount of support they had out there. This is exactly what this is about, trying to give people away, because you can talk till you're blue in the face, but you actually have to change the systems and allow people to weigh in. And what I found is, once people gave that $5, they own this campaign, just like people who gave big checks to my other campaign. All good people from little to, to big donations, but I think it gives people a mechanism to get to be part of it. And then you can imagine running this way if you're an activist from that part of town, which you probably truthfully cannot reasonably imagine under the old system. Um, I, I think it's... Uh, 
It's an interesting point. Um, I'm not sure that those people east of 82nd are going to get more attention from uh, their elected representative who, on the basis of a $5 contribution. Um, I think when you look at the flip side of that argument, you take a look at, at who this measure disempowers, and it, it clearly is uh, Sandy McDonough, uh, the, 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 the people she represents uh, in terms of uh, moneyed interests who uh, in the past have been extremely influential at City Hall. And I, what's interesting about that is that um, it, it's a fundamental restructuring of the balance of power in this city and taking away the, the, the influence that Cindy McDonough and the Portland Business Alliance have may have unintended consequences uh, I think, in terms of the direction of the city in the future. Next question. Uh, Ray Polanyi, a city club member. Uh, it was mentioned before the poor voting turnout. Uh, the fewer people voting, it seems to me, the more important that those who do vote be unattached to any special, specific money interest. Let me give you an example. Uh, of course, it has to be a transportation example. Um, light rail on the transit mall would probably not happen were it not for short-sighted short special interest. My question is, do you agree or don't you agree? And if so, why? I think Eric should take that one first. <laughs> Well, I don't think we know what all will happen. I, I don't know the answer to that question. I do know that um, city staff and folks who shape the big land use questions for the commissioners, and, and obviously they get shaped for us, spend uh, a disproportionate amount of time with the interest who contribute to, to the commissioners in a large way. I mean, that's a fact. I mean, you can go get our schedules and you can, I, I don't think it'll be any shock to anybody that in the year preceding an election, those schedules will be even more heavily weighted um, with the folks that are then gonna give a year later. I mean, so the, the, uh, the people who can give a lot of money get more access under a system that runs on the amount of money that you give, and that's gonna have consequences. Um, Again, I don't think those are dishonest. I don't think those, it's just it's just the reality of, of of how systems work. It's just like anything else. The biggest customer at the bank gets gets um, gets a different level of service. You know, it doesn't mean the bank is giving them a rate of interest or something else that that's not right. Um, I think over time you will see different policy decisions if this system survives and we finance campaigns in a different way. Whether you would see a different one on the light rail on the mall or not, I don't think it's that that black and white. That that I mean, I don't know that that was such a bad decision as Ray thinks it was, but I do think over time you would see different solutions. I mean, the funny thing right now is it's sort of unimaginable to, to most people in this country that, that big money doesn't dominate politics. People don't even get, don't, can't even imagine that at this point. And so I think if we put, keep the system in place, it's, it's spreading very quickly. Albuquerque adopted it last year. Arizona and Maine do it. New Jersey, after a scandal, is doing it. Um, you're going to start to see lots of different solutions. Um, the mayor, uh, mayor, the governor of Arizona is the first one in history after running clean money to make good on a plan on prescription drugs. And, and so there's just a lot of things that could happen. How it would affect one policy, I, I, I don't know that I feel comfortable uh, predicting, but I do think over time you would see very different decisions made. Um, some good, probably some bad. Do either of you want to, do you want to come? Yeah, I agree with Eric about the um, light rail issue. I'm, I'm not sure I want to speculate how that would be different, but I sure don't want to say that um, if we have so few people voting, then we better make sure they're not influenced. I, I think what we need to do is figure out why we have so few v people voting. I mean, let's look at it. With 28% of the qualified voters in Multnomah County actually voting in the primary, that means that we elected and with all due respect, Eric, because I'm not saying this is a bad outcome, but that we elected a couple members of city council with 15 to 20 percent of the people saying they wanted them there, of qualified voters. I think that's a real issue. We need to get people out. We need to get them voting. We need to get them more inspired in what our government is doing, and that's the root cause of the problem. In terms of um, money influencing the outcome and people with money getting more access to 
our government leaders, I'd really have to take a look at the appointment books because I'm not sure that I, I think that's, that's the case. Um, and quite honestly, I'm not really a money person. I'm a single mom, sole income earner in my household, and I can't make a lot of political contributions. But I did take a look at, at Eric's c &E's, and he's gotten a lot of different contributions from a lot of different sources, including some business people, including at one point even Portland General Electric Company. And I don't think we'd ever say Eric is anything less than independent and out there and making his own decisions, not biased by the people who are making contributions. And most of the people we elect and the people we do elect, we should expect that they're looking at issues broadly, they're talking to all kinds of people and making decisions based on what's in the best interest of the community. Comment? No? Okay, next question. Uh, Justin Gottlieb, City Club member and Portland Business Alliance member. The thing that really concerns me about this debate is, or discussion as we should say, is that we're really getting into either publicly funded campaigns or school funding or police officers, that it's an either or debate. Do you, either of you or anyone up there see any way to bring it in so that we can have good schools and know that if we want to run for office that we're going to have access to the money. I mean, that's really what's going to engage the population. And I just want to hear your thoughts on this either or uh, tenor of the debate. Well, I think, you know, the either in terms of an actual funding choice is, is, is pretty falsely constructed. I mean, the, the, the amount of money that, that was spent on, on this election cycle amounts to half or one tenth of one percentage point of the city's city's budget and and it comes from a variety of places including you know people who are buying it comes from all the funds so including people who are say developers from California building downtown a very tiny tiny one tenth of a one point piece of their permit fee would go into this fund so there isn't a, a chunk of money that you can just grab but I guess you basically have to get to the basic premise do you believe it's cheaper over the long run, if you just want to talk economics, my belief is that as citizens, it will be cheaper over the course of 10 or 20 years to finance the elections yourself at the cost of about a buck per person per year than it is to do it the way we do it, because I think we, make, we will make different spending decisions. So I think in the long run, this will help in that front, but I do agree completely it's, it's, it's a false choice. I also just want to point out very quickly that I've never heard anybody on any side of this uh, I'm looking at my friend, Representative McPherson, moved to repeal the $50 uh, credit you get for giving political contributions. I expect everyone in this room takes $50 out of the state's coffers every year, 100 for your, for your, for as a couple. That's actually the money that funds schools, by the way, just to point out, the state funds schools. So if anybody is on, against voter-owned elections, it's, you really have to say, I'm not going to take that credit because it's 50 times the amount that you're taking out of the city coffers to fund the election. So, this is like any other system that's controlled by, by a certain group of folks. There's all kinds of anomalies in it. The idea of the state financing elections is well accepted by everybody. It was advertised on Ginny Burdick's remit. If you send it in, you can take it off your state taxes. Um, so you know, this is just a cleaner, over-the-top way to do it. And by having everybody do it, it's a dollar a person. I think, um, first of all, we, I'm definitely not saying that we shouldn't do something to look at how, we, um, how elections are done. I'm saying what this, we need to do is sit down and have a discussion, first defining what the problem is, and then in a more broad terms, and then looking at all the possible solutions rather than leaping to the one that uses scarce city dollars. I mean, the truth is, the city has said, and I was at a council meeting just a week ago where they said again that they're concerned about their revenues and the ability with existing revenues to fund the programs that they have defined as important for taxpayers. And so the question becomes, was funding campaign elections at this point more important than those other priority areas defined by city council that they have not been able to adequately fund? And the truth is, the city has been funding schools for years. And they've come up with money, thankfully, but, and they've also imposed taxes on citizens to pay for schools. So, it, it, and I, this isn't just about schools, it's about all city budgets, and it's a question of priorities. So, Justin, I don't think it's an either or. I'm saying, was this really the right thing at this time to use scarce public resources when we can't buy school books, when we don't have enough police officers? 
And lastly, I want to say the argument that this is just a little bit from every budget, we took it all out of the administrative costs. If we had that kind of extra money in our city administrative costs, I think we need to take a real close look at them and figure out if that money can be deployed to critical public services that the citizens of this city need and want. Do you wish uh, to add anything? It, it's, it's all a matter of priorities, um, obviously. Uh, the city seems to find money to fund things, um, but, uh, and I think the cost of uh, the public campaign financing is a fraction of a lot of other, uh, fraction of the cost of a lot of other programs that I hear more complaints about um, from, from the people I talk to. It's a, it's a fraction of the cost of the, the visioning project, which, um, uh, people, in, including in City Hall, are, are always uh, talking about. And that said, I think it's a really emotional topic for people. Um, and you can't say it's not a valid one in terms of spending taxpayer money on something other than kids, other than cops, that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry to say we won't have time for more questions. The format that was designed today allows each of the panelists to make any wrap-up remarks. This isn't a summation, but if there's something that you think we need to be thinking about that we haven't yet talked about, could you please let us know? Who would like to go first? Well, I've probably said, said everything I was thinking. Um, you know, my, my sense is I would actually um, maybe build off of Sandy's challenge to the group, which is, you know, I, I'm not satisfied with the, with the argument that's being made today that what we should just do is talk and look for different solutions. These are, these are, these are topics that are at the heart of our democracy and, and people are talking and looking daily everywhere. And so what I think we have right now is a system that is, that again, let's remember it's voluntary. You can still run the other way. And the idea that, that a person running under this system can't be outspent is just flat not true. Um, the match only goes up to 300,000, which is less than any serious candidate has spent in the last 10 years before this time, so um, in, in a real heated race. So, so it's still a choice you make. I would urge you to keep working with us. Let's make it work. If Let's make it the best uh, system in the country, and then we can really move on and take care of other things. And it's not good enough to say there must be another idea. What I have not heard today from anyone is a single concrete idea that's legal under, under the Oregon Constitution to do. So if you buy my opening premise that we make bad public policy because of the influence of money, then we need to move forward and make this system as good as it can be because there is not a better approach. Well, as I said in my introductory remark, I think it's a good thing that this city council started a discussion about what we can do to re-engage our citizens in our government and in our election process. And you know, I'm interested that Commissioner Sen said there's no other options that are legal under our Oregon Constitution. I think he's referring to campaign spending limits. Well, you know what, guys? We've changed the Constitution before. If that's what this takes, and I'm not saying this is the right option, I'm saying we should have a discussion. Should we do this? 37 other states have done it. We're concerned that by rushing to a, a, a outcome that involves city dollars before we looked at the potential, um, other potential options went too fast and we're using scarce public resources that could be used in other ways. What we believe needs to happen is that the voters need to decide whether they want voter-owned elections. Let's put it on the ballot. Let's put it on the ballot in November when no city council races up, no individual candidate will be impacted. I even think that both sides could agree to a spending cap. 100,000, 150,000, and make it happen. And then if the voters say, yes, we want to make this change in our elections, and we really want these so-called voter-owned elections, then so be it. We'll do it. Mr. Budney? Uh, just, uh, I don't have any final great opinions to utter, but just as a reporter, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. It is. Uh, uh, pretty significant change, and um, I don't know that uh, we know exactly what will happen. Um, thanks for your patience. <laughs> okay, I would like to thank our panelists, Sandra McDonough, Commissioner Eric Stan, and Nick Budnick for participating in a lively and enlightening panel. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, our audience uh, here at City Club, and our radio and TV audience for being part of this discussion. 
If you'd like to continue the discussion about this topic, please go to our website and join, uh, join the Citizens' Blog. We are adjourned. <laughs>